Hi there. Welcome to the Bears Gym. A little Bible study today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. A lot of uh, heavy things we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about uh, confessing the Lord before mankind. We're going to talk about trust, who to fear. A lot of, a lot of good things. So with that, we have a nice long chapter in Luke 12, so here we go. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light. That which ye have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. You know what? If you were to bug my house, I don't really care. Because I have nothing to hide. And that's why my media is, is for the most part, open and public. Because I have nothing to hide. Um... The music I listen to, the life I live, the jobs I do, I have nothing to hide. They're, they're open and free, okay? And so I don't want to be a hypocrite and live one life on Sunday and another life on Wednesday, okay? I'm a factory worker, so I want to treat my family, my coworkers, and my brothers and sisters in Christ the same, okay? Now... Each person, sometimes, there is a very special protocol that applies to different people. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine. So there are some aspects of my life I'm not just going to share with you, okay? Because some of you out there might be swine. I don't know. I hope you're not. But some of them might be where you would turn and tear me if I shared some very, something very precious to me that's only between me and the Lord. Maybe I've shared with my wife or my kids. There are other people that are hypocrites, like the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're hypocrites. Jesus didn't say love, 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 love. That love wasn't bestowed upon the Pharisees and Sadducees, the hypocrites. It wasn't. Whether you like it or not, it wasn't. Okay, they were wicked. That's like saying, well, Jesus loves the demons. Okay, where do you go? So understanding is that is for those in the household of faith. Those are for those who are innocent and don't really know what they're doing. But the Pharisees and Sadducees, they knew what they were doing. They were hypocrites in the body of Christ or the church, or the temple. And that's where blasphemy of the Holy Spirit comes in. Because they know the truth and yet... They hate somebody that lives and practices the truth because they're self-condemned. And they continue and they blaspheme. They slander him, accusing him of being the enemy when really they're the enemy. That's where the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit comes in. And we're going to get to that shortly. So there's different aspects. You have people that you love. They're in your family. They're in your church. They're involved in a relationship of fornication, living together, or they're involved in drunkenness, or they're involved in uh, marijuana use, or uh, hallucinogens, or whatever, or they're liars, or they're, they're cheaters, they're always ripping people off in the church, and you, and you come to them and you give them ample warning, and eventually you cast them out of the body of Christ until they repent. And they are not to be allowed back in until there's some, some contrition, some an attitude of wishing to change and repentance, an actual change of sin, actual change from sin, away from sin, to Jesus Christ, repentance. Confession, acknowledging guilt, and, and shunning it, turning, turning all the way around spiritually in your heart. So there's different aspects of how we treat various people, but we are still open to those that are willing to listen. Okay, that's, that's kind of a hard mystery. It's like a paradigm, but it's there. OK, 
Okay, the paradigm is there. Like Jesus on the cross, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, he didn't, wasn't, that wasn't shed upon the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're wicked. But for the Romans who were simply involved in the crucifixion process, it really was not their baby. And I'm not a, uh, uh, against any f form of people, but there was a people that the Jewish people said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. That brought a curse for those that continue to war against Jesus Christ. And that curse is only broke when you turn to Jesus Christ as a father and a son in the next generation. The children do not suffer the consequences of the father, but if they don't take on the backpack of Jesus Christ and follow Jesus Christ, a lot of the sins from their father and mother might trickle into their lives. And they'll wonder how it got there because that those things kind of pass on. And so if you don't pick up the backpack of Jesus Christ and follow him for yourself, you might find the sins of your parents getting loaded back onto your back and you're carried with you. All right, let's move along here. Luke chapter 12, verse 4, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I send to you, fear him. He's not talking about Satan. Satan doesn't cast into hell. Did you know that? Satan is not ruling in hell. Okay? Satan will be an occupant in hell, but he doesn't rule in hell. There's only one that can cast into hell, and that's our Heavenly Father. If you continue to reject his promise to mankind through Jesus Christ, if you continue to reject how easy he's made salvation, yes, you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's not hell, but hell is kind of a holding place until the great white throne judgment, and then mankind, the demons, the fallen angels will be cast into outer darkness in the lake of fire for eternity. And yes, that outer darkness, that outer damnation, that punishment will last forever. It's not an extinguishing, as I've heard some teach, that you're just extinguished. You, you, your spiritual body will go on forever. You can't extinguish your, your spirit. It goes on forever. And it'll either be in eternal righteousness or in eternal damnation. It's one or the other. There's not another third place. It's one or the other. That's where mankind will dwell. Now there is a, just as a side note, there is a place, very possibly, where there will be animals dwelling. And that is when this current earth passes away. But the Bible says Babylon and so forth, some of these other Places on earth will be dwelt in by the animals uh, perpetually. And it does seem to indicate that the earth will exist someplace and the animals will dwell there. We don't really know to what extent because um, we don't know everything. But he does has given us an aspect where mankind is going to be. And that is in the lake of fire or in eternity with Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Are you worth more than a sparrow? Yep, you betcha you are. So what that means is God hasn't forgotten about you. If you choose to ignore him, that's your business, but he hasn't forgotten about you. It doesn't mean he's going to let you into heaven if you continue to disobey him and live in a carnal, godless way, he will allow you to make your own choice. But he hasn't forgot about you. And um, if you choose Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's what he wants for you. That's what he wants, but he won't force you. If you choose to live godless and sinful on this life, you'll have chosen, chosen, and you will have chose the lake of fire out of your own doing, not his, and he will allow you to make that choice. Verse 8, 
Also I say unto whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. If you don't confess Jesus Christ before men, if you're so ashamed of your faith in Jesus Christ that you won't say that you're a Christian to your friends, family, co-workers, one day Jesus is going to say, I don't know you either. That's one aspect of confession. The other aspect of confession is abiding in the word of God. You cannot confess the fact that you're a Christian and then live just like the world. You cannot be tossing drinks at the bar chasing women around and saying, well, yeah, I'm a Christian too. You can't. Your own deeds confess what you believe in. You believe in lawlessness. There's one aspect of confession is from your mouth. Another aspect is the fruit of your life. And they most, both, both must go hand in hand. Confession and fruit. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. Point one. Pharisees and Sadducees. I believe they knew somewhat that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But he exposed them. He exposed them for what they were, phonies. And they hated him for it, even though I believe they knew he was the promised Messiah. But he threatened their easy life, their living prestigiously. And that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. To know the truth and yet reject it, by not following it, and number two, by persecuting against it out of sheer hatred, even though you know it's the truth. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When you are persecuted as a Christian, don't worry about what you're gonna say. The Lord will give you what to say in that moment. When the end times come, or perhaps in the past, when the Christians have been brought before the Caesars and the Neros and the kings, the synagogues for persecution, don't worry about what you're going to say. The Lord will give you in that hour. He says his spirit will speak through you. And sometimes when I'm doing these Bible studies, or Bible study in the Church of the Living Room. I don't always really know what I'm going to say, though I've studied the scripture and the passage over and over during the week. I don't really know every aspect that I'm going to bring up and share until I'm actually doing it. And then it's like, wow, there's like life emanating from me because I want to do his will. And his spirit gives me what to say as I do it. It's kind of an interesting beautiful paradigm that belongs to the children of God. Let's continue. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Don't worry about what's going on in this earth and people's banks, bank accounts and their 401k plans and how much money they boast to have. That's not for Christians. Don't worry about it. The Lord will take care of us. We're not concerned about riches stored away. Many have put away much riches and never got to enjoy it. Don't be that person. Store up your riches in heaven so that you can enjoy it forever. He spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought him forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, What shall I do? I have no room where to bestow my fruits. He said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build bigger ones. 
and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then those whose things this shall be, whose will they be? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. Don't get caught up in the rat race of the world. Store your riches up in heaven, and you will be blessed forevermore. He said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life which ye shall eat, neither for the body which ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and yet God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, when taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not. And yet I say to you that Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like as one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Seek ye not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Believers and non-believers, God does care about you, but he especially cares about his children. And if you have made a proclamation of faith, and even if you're not really walking right, he hasn't forgotten you. Now, don't let that be a license to sin in your life. Because if you go on into the eternal realm without straightening your life out, you very well may be spending eternity in the lake of fire because you have chosen to disobey the Lord. But it will be your choice, not his. He's given you every tool to follow him because the Bible is very clear. There is no temptation or trial that is given among men that cannot be overcome. That is too great for you. He won't allow that. So maybe, yes, your times that you're in right now are hard, but you will, you will endure. You will overcome. To whatever end, I don't know. But stay faithful to the Lord. And you will reap your riches in heaven. All right, verse 31. Rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give you eternal life. The choice is yours. Are you willing to give up sin and follow Christ? Are you willing? If you're willing, he's ready to have it for you. He's going to prepare a place for you in the eternal realm. Sell that ye have and give alms. Provide for yourself bags which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that faileth not. Where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. May your treasure lie in Jesus Christ, friend in the word of God, as it lives in you. May that be your treasure, and you'll never be sad. You'll never be sad that you made that choice. No, everything won't go your way, but you'll have an eternal hope waiting for you in heaven. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. There's going to be time in the, during the marriage supper of the Lamb in the heavens, in the new Jerusalem, where the Lord is going to wait on us. I don't know how he's going to do it. 
The Bible simply says that he is. It's beautiful. And if you shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants that those are waiting for the Lord to come, keeping their lives clean and their fires lit in their hearts for Jesus Christ. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour that ye think not. Sometimes I talk to people and they're living a, a party life, though claiming Christ at the same time. They say, I want to live a little bit. And I say, friend, you might die a little bit and you're going to be lost for eternity. What use is that? How much fun is that? It's not worth it. Be ready for the Lord at all times. There's nothing on this earth that's worth losing your salvation. Nothing. Not a person, not fun, not friends, nothing. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us or even unto all? The Lord then said who, to them, He that is faithful and a wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season, blessed is that servant, blessed, blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all that he hath. But if that servant, this is the other servant, says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servant and maidens, and to eat and drink and be drunk. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in pieces, and will appoint him his portion with the non believers. That servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knoweth not did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, and of him shall be much required. To whom men have committed much of him shall they ask the more. Now, I'm giving you a lot of information here. Unfortunately, perhaps... I've become your greatest enemy because I've just given you a lot of information, a lot of truth. And if you reject it, I've become one of your greatest enemies. If you receive it, I could be one of your best friends. Verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straight until it be accomplished? Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth, I tell you no, but rather division. For from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. A New Testament principle and a precept which is so highly misunderstood in church teaching Show me a house that's at complete peace. I'll show you a house where the mommy and daddy don't stand up against sin. You show me a house where there's turmoil, where the father stands up in righteousness against sins that are going on in the family. I'll show you a house on fire for the Lord because that's like the church. There's no church at perfect peace. There's got to be some turmoil in the church because of the pastors, the staff, the deacons, they're in a a war of righteousness against sin in the church. And sometimes they have to ask people to leave the church. They have to correct people, rebuke people for continuing in sin. Same with the father. Father must be con correcting sin in his family. And that's why the aspect of a, a preacher in the church, how the New Testament says that the children also much believe. But the point being is, it's not that he can make his children believe, but they are in subjection to him because the father is exercising biblical disciplines in the home. A father can't make his children be believers in Jesus Christ, but he can exercise biblical discipline in the home. And that's what a godly man must do. And that's why here, if you have controversy in your home, your kids are running around being naughty, good. It's because you're aware of it and you're correcting them. Don't give up the fight. Keep the fight going. Keep the fight going. Don't ever give up the fight. Don't ever get tired. Keep the fight going. Okay? 
That's what we're here for. We're here to be salt and light, not pacifists. We just lay down and just let everything happen. That's not an eternal life, okay? We're here to be salt and light. And that's why Jesus said, he come to bring fire is, fire is fire. Fire is problems. Fire is hurt. Fire is pain. And it purifies the body of Christ. It purifies your life. It purifies your home. So if there's controversy in your home because the mom and dad are fighting against sin in the, the children's lives, good. Good. That means you have a godly home. You have a godly home. If everything's at peace and there's no problems, I would say there's a problem, friend, and you're not addressing sin. Okay? Because the Bible says Jesus didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring division. And there's very few families, if any ever, where all the children are all believers and all the parents and it's all just all just a big love circle. There's always going to be one or two. And there's going to be a rift, a division. Because the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, shaves like a razor between truth, falsehood, right, wrong. There's no gray areas. It's sin or righteousness. Now we live in this world. I, have to, I live in, a, 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 in an environment of, of where I'm hearing garbage day in and day out. There's nothing I can do about that, but I continue on to be salt and light. So if there's strife in your home of righteousness, realize you have a godly home, friend. You have a home according to the word of God because that fight can never end. Let's go on. He said also to the people, when you see the clouds rise out of the west, straightway say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be heat, and it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell thee, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. Sometimes Christians get into financial difficulties, and there's nothing we can do about it. We lose our jobs, we lose overtime, we have medical problems in the family, and we're strapped. We buy a house that's a money pit, and we can't, we, we can't anticipate those things, okay? And so we just have to struggle through life and do the very best we can. The Bible says if there's an aspect that you can work it out, then you work it out. That's just common practice of life. It's not the ultimate sin that you get into financial difficulties. Everybody does. But you work it out. Just work it out little by little the best you can. Don't get stressed about it. Just do the very best that you can. All right. We did, a lot of, we did a lot of things today, didn't we? we? We covered a lot. We did of homes, hypocrites, peace, love, obedience, repentance. We talked about a lot of good things. And so I hope you've enjoyed. I have enjoyed. And so I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to let you research this for yourself. Prayerfully. And next time, we're going to pick up in the book of Luke and we're going to find some more nuggets to grasp, even some paradigms to muse over through the week. So until next time, from the Bears Gym and the Gospel of Luke, God bless. <laughs>